pray that God will continue to give you more grace to push some who are still hiding at the back and are claiming to be beatified members, but they've never sang. God will give you grace to push them forward in Jesus' name. All right. There are, no, there are supposed to be no bench warmers in beatitude. Two things, um, or th maybe three. Number one is to thank God for Mr. and Mrs. Chubuz Okanu. They are new members, so some of you may not know them. They just had a baby boy. Uh, sister had um, CS, but she's been discharged, so they are home now. We thank God for them. Baptismal class will hold. And to thank all of us, uh, we got our first set of chairs, 50 chairs. Yesterday, we got another set of 100 chairs. So we have 450 chairs. So thank you to all of you who have given. Uh, the privilege of being pastors that I know those who are supposed to sit on chairs and extra, you know, so some people don't have chairs yet, but grace has covered all of you, so everybody has a chair. Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, our thoughts will be in the first five verses of Luke chapter 13, and we want to consider a call to repentance. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 5, Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 5. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 5. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 5. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that is before us. Thank you for your spirit that is here. Thank you for the power that your spirit has to interpret your word and give us understanding. Apart from that, we ask that your spirit will bring conviction to our hearts, that we will submit to you for transformation in our lives, that our, your name will be glorified because we will live shining the light of Jesus Christ. Speak to us now. We've asked and we ask again, every issue may it be addressed by your word. Every challenge may be addressed by your word. In the power of the Holy Spirit, do this for us now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Luke chapter 13, I would read the verses so that it would help you understand why I tell you a few things before we get into the, the, um, the trying to understand the text. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent you too will perish. A call to repentance. When disaster occurs, our hearts go out to those who are caught up in such disasters. We are, we are concerned about those who have passed on. We are concerned about those who have lost loved ones because some disaster have occurred. The OHCHR, that's the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, records that from February 20, 24, 2022, that was the day the Russian Ukraine war started. From that day, February 24, 2022, to 30th July 2023, 9,369 people have died. That's apart from those who are injured. 9,369 people have died. They go on to state that from 1st of July to 30th of July 2022, 100 and 2023, 143 people have died. In 2004, we woke up to, I tried to understand what happened, and they said there was an earthquake under the sea that brought about what we now knew as the tsunami. The tsunami claimed 200, approximately 225,000 lives died from the tsunami in 2004. Coming home, we're not very good with this kind of records. Death toll from disasters, flooding, 
bomb blast. Last month, we had what happened in trade more. And, and we don't really know how many people. Our friends who said somebody died, we don't really know. Kidnappers and the likes. Continually, they break our heart as they do. So they also raise the questions that we have in our hearts. And Jesus here, because the Bible is complete, Jesus here teaches the urgency for repentance when disaster comes and uses two examples to explain how these calamities happen. The first was not his. The first was some people coming to meet Jesus. It looked as if they were looking for some political answer to what was going on. And when they came to Jesus, they spoke to him and told him what happened. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you too will perish. Let me start by reminding you that for all of us who are sitting down here, tall, short, you know, we tell ourselves, those of us who are short, we are vertically challenged. Those of you who are tall, you are vertically advantaged. Whatever you are, whether you are slim, you are fat, whether you are dark, you are light-skinned, whatever you are, whether you are educated or uneducated, well-traveled, not well-traveled, the common denominator between all of us is death. And I'll tell you something that I will tell you again, that you don't need to be, you don't need to want to die, you will die. And I'll tell you that again, you don't need to want to die. You will die. But are you ready? And so Jesus says that this tragedy that has happened, the concern should not be more of the tragedy. The concern should be those of you who are alive, are you ready for what has befallen those ones who have died? They came up to Jesus and they brought the question and they brought a political situation and they said that this is what Pilate had done. Nobody records this story. History records this story of how Pilate executed these Galileans and, and what happened and how their blood was mixed. It's not that they were mixed, but it appears that it was during the time of sacrifice that it, was, that it took place. They wanted Jesus to address the problem of religion and politics, and how Pilate, using his power as a religious leader, as, as a political leader, sorry, attacked these people during a religious festival. They came for sacrifice, Pilate used his power and executed them, and their blood was mixed with the sacrifice. But Jesus didn't address that because there was a greater problem than religion or politics. Whatever the circumstances that death cause. Unfortunately, these pilgrims suffered this political death. Whatever the circumstances that death or cause, the question will always be why did it happen? Who is to blame? Jesus is saying, you who are observing, are you ready? Also, Jesus says, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because the Jewish people felt that when such disaster falls on you, it must have been seen. Jesus is saying, it has nothing to do whether they were righteous or unrighteous. The issue is, there's a common denominator between all of us. And to escape that perishing, you must repent. To repent is to turn your life around, to give it to Christ, to give it to him to guide you. And this is the call that we see in this passage. So he says, do you think that they were better, they were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered? This question coupled with verse 4 reflects a common notion among the Jewish people about pain. Jesus says, except you repent. And for some of, some of us, and I'll tell you, when things happen, we are, we are quick to want to judge. We are quick to want to find why. Jesus is saying, no. When those kind of things happen, the question you should be asking more is, am I ready? Forget, don't forget that this, this political tragedy happened without the people being ready as it were. They came for sacrifice. They came to worship God. Pilate had his own agenda, definitely motivated by Satan, but Pilate had his agenda. And when it happened, they brought the matter to Jesus. Can you settle this matter? Jesus says, it's not those who have died. Those of you who are asking me the question, are you ready? Have you repented? Because there's a greater disaster when you perish without Jesus Christ. 
But not only political disasters, in verse 4 to verse 5, Jesus himself reminds them of a natural disaster. Look at verse 4. Or, or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? Jesus cites a second event to make the same point. So rather than a political tragedy, he uses a natural disaster that could be likened to our own day hurricane or tornadoes. That tower collapsed and killed 18 people. They knew where the tower was. They knew what the tower did. They knew the supply it gave of water to the people and the history it had about, about in, in Israel. But the tragic event draws the same lesson in verse 5. It says, I tell you no. It has nothing to do particularly with whether they were guilty. It had nothing to do with whether they were sinners. It had more to do with you who is alive. Are you ready? So Jesus told his hearers that instead of trying to find someone to blame, which is quick for us. And there's nothing wrong, particularly when you say, this is who caused it. But sometimes I'm, I'm afraid because when we begin to attack people, we really are attacking the wrong people. We're only attacking agents. Satan is doing his work, but we're really attacking the wrong people. But should, should we ask why? Yes. In our part of the world, medical science, we don't even allow medical science. So if somebody passes on and they want to carry out an autopsy, no. Let them rest. They have died. In other parts of the world, they want to carry out an autopsy to find out why. So that other people don't go the same way. Jesus is saying that as we ask the question why, which is good, but we should not be fixated on the question why. The question should be a call to repentance, to check our ways, those of us who are alive. And many a times we do not ask that question. You know why? I'll read you the passage in Ecclesiastes very soon. When we've turned the place of mourning to a place of celebration, then we've lost the capacity to think through the issues of death. When we've turned the place of money, you know, if there's death, somebody passes on. I don't know how it started, but I know growing up, a couple of things never happened. Things like a shoibi never happened. The person dies, you wear what you have, you go and bury the person. Hey, let's, let's, let's play back. It didn't matter the age. So we added a new nomenclature so that we can celebrate. We say it's a celebration of life. Mama has lived long. Let's celebrate. Baba lived long. Let's celebrate. Those ones that died when we didn't to celebrate, well, their death different from the ones who are celebrating now. Growing up, I knew that when you go to a place of death, you don't eat. They serve you food, you go away. Now we wait for the food, and when we don't get, we're angry. When you go to a place of death that time, you don't see children. You don't see children. They hide the children. You try to explain to them, but they don't carry children. Today, uh -uh. even the children have a shobi. They dress them up. So once you've lost the ability to contemplate in a place of mourning, it becomes a place of celebration. You've lost that capacity to think through the issues of life. So that's why we are how we are. Everything is a celebration. It's a shock to me. Have you ever gone? It's a shock to me. My auntie passed on, passed on in Lagos, most of you know. And I didn't know, coming from the north, I've, I've, I've gone to this, I've gone to a choir room and that's a, it's a, it's a whole different ball game altogether. And when they brought her casket, I, we were at the church, and they brought the casket. And I noticed that they brought the casket out and kept on the ground. I started playing, and I was asking, what's wrong? They said, before that casket goes to where they will put it to lie in state, we have to drop money. I said, wow. The place now, when death happens, is fundraising for some people. So once we've changed the reason, and the Bible makes no mistake, Ecclesiastes says that it is better to be in a place of mourning 
than a parting place. Why? Because in the place of mourning, you sit down to reason what's going on. But when we've turned the place of mourning to a place of parting, when do we sit down to reason? And that's why Jesus is saying that, you see, you'll be asking the wrong question if you're asking whether those people that died in all the air crashes that occurred, were they bad? Was it God's judgment? If they were bad or it's God's judgment, are you ready in case it happens? Those people that have died from the hands of kidnappers. Those people that have died from road accidents. I was at the mortuary the other day, at the cemetery the other day, and they told me that the section where we were, I couldn't even count the number of people, that all those, all those graves that we see were between the middle of January till this month. As we were there, we went with one person, they brought another person, then they brought a third person with a good number of people. And they said the guy is in his 40s, assistant director in one of the ministries. Went for an official assignment, was come back, had an accident, and then he died. I thought that was bad. And then the guy who was standing by me said that they were not, that a few weeks ago they were here for a burial. I said, he said, that what happened? He said, the man and his wife went to church. And they had a meeting. And then the wife said, okay, you be, have the meeting, and I will go home. After the meeting, I will get a bike and come home. Got the bike close to his house, look at him, look at his house, just to st stop and come down. A car came, cleared him, the guy died. For a moment, we cry. I've gone for burials where I saw somebody wailing, crying. I've told you before, banging themselves on the door, crying and hitting themselves and rolling on the ground. And I, We're trying to comfort the person. The next thing, I saw them with a plate of rice and Fanta and everything was all right. Why? We have even developed the place where today they are hired mourners. So you can pay people to come and cry. So it sounds as if there's crying going on. We've lost the idea of what Jesus is saying. He said, it's not. Those people who have died, they finished their story. You who is alive, are you considering that your own day will come? Some people are quick to say that all these political and natural disasters and bandits, earthquake and all of that is the result of divine judgment on God. It's okay. In reality, it's more complex than that. Sometimes it's not God's judgment. Sometimes it's God's judgment. Sometimes it's the sin of the Father. I mean, if you read some of the things you, you read, I was, I was reading the other day of a man by the name Gehazi. He was, he was the assistant to a prophet. Do you remember that man? And because of his greed, because of his greed, the Bible says that God said to him that because of your greed, leprosy will befall you. Ah, I thought it was just him. He says, and your whole generation will suffer leprosy because of the greed of Gehazi. So that there are certain things that maybe had happened before that you didn't even know about. But yet it has come and God is on the throne. The question is, when you see those things, when you see death, do you ask yourself, what if it happens now? Calamities in themselves are not good. But sometimes they find a way of fulfilling God's purpose. They serve as a wake-up call to believers. They serve as a wake-up call to unbelievers to, to repent and to believers to repent and live a, a life that glorifies God. In the next verses, leading from verse 6, we will see that by God's grace next week. Jesus gives a parable of that one who was not fruitful and we'll look at that. And there's a call that's attached to it here that... When all of this happens, we can classify them natural disasters. We can classify them political disasters in our own situation. I don't know which one. God has saved us from natural disasters. We are suffering. When you hear what is going on with what our brother Obed shared, you ask yourself, what are we going to look for in Niger when there is fire in our house? Do you understand? What are we going to look for in DJ? The guys say they are tired of the people who have been milking them. Oh, yeah? Friends, let us not be carried away with who to blame or what happened, as it were, when we hear of this. But let's be more concerned with what the Lord is saying. Except you repent you will perish. By perish means that you are having an eternity that is outside God, except you repent. Three passages of scripture and I'll be out of your way. 
I've read one to you. I'll recite, take, take, take you there again. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 2, and I want to read it in the Good News Translation. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 2. It is better to go to a home where there is mourning than to one where there is a party. This is why. Because the living should always remind themselves that death is waiting for us all. The living should always remind themselves that death is waiting for us all. <laughs> Remember that passage. It's better to go to the place of mourning so that you reflect your life. You reflect, what am I doing? So that when you are alive, you are assured that you have a better tomorrow. Job chapter 14 and verse 5. Job 14, 5. Again, I will read the new good news translation. Job 14, 5. The length of our lives is decided beforehand. The number of months you will live, you have settled it and it can't be changed. The length of our lives is decided beforehand. The number of months we will live, God has settled it and it cannot be changed. And you don't know it. God has determined this, how long you will live. Even when we read the passage of scripture, you know there was a man that ordered to die and the prophet told him, he said, hey, God, give me extra days. God said, no problem. Those extra days didn't surprise God. God knew he was going to ask. So it was just him asking and God said, no problem. I know you ask. Take the days. So whether you stay, you, you know the days or you don't know the days, the question is, the, the point is, God has determined how long you will be on this earth. The last passage is Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Friends, brothers and sisters, however you try to interpret and find the reason for death and find the cause of death and find whatever happened, death still remains a mystery. However we try to attack, maybe there was safe, no safety, which is okay to help improvement of life. But one thing is sure, you don't need to want to die, you will die. You don't need to want to. You can declare from now till eternity, one day, young or old, you will die. My question to you is, there's a call to repentance so that you'll be ready for that day. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day when you will go? Jesus says that <laughs> those guys that died politically, except you repent, you will go the same way. Those guys that died from natural disasters, except you repent, you will go the same way. Are you ready? The only way to be ready is repentance. You see, your education is good, but your education cannot prepare you for death. Never forget. Your exposure is excellent. It will help you while you are here. But when that day comes, your exposure may even cause more calamity. Why? Because the people left behind, because of your level of exposure, there will be too many people wanting to do too many things. And then they will create more problems. When we were at TY, Uncle Kachiro showed us a, it's like a booklet. Colored from beginning to end. Wonderful program of one guy who died. Very rich guy. Very extremely rich guy. And he told us that the, 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 the friends told the wife, he has been good to us. Don't bother to touch the money he has left for you. We will sponsor everything. As I speak to you, the wife and another woman, they are in court because of property that he left. They too will leave it for another person. Who will leave it? For another person. So your wealth does not prepare you. It's repentance that prepares you. Your good job is good. 
uh, these chairs we are buying is because some people have good job now. It's good, but it will not prepare you except repentance. Your beauty, you've charmed all the men, even the office, once you enter, they know you've come. Hallelujah. Your beauty cannot intimidate my Savior if you have not repented. Your six-pack, fine boy, fine boy, you get it? Eh? Fine boy, no spot, no pimples. Correct chap. You understand? Impeccable speech. Speaks very well. Baba, if you've not repented, you are not ready. Your big house. First of all, I thank God it cannot be bigger than heaven. And what God is preparing. Your wonderful house. The other day I read somewhere that the king of, I think Saudi Arabia, gave Cristiano Ronaldo a complete gold motorcycle. The motorcycle complete. The whole motorcycle is made from gold. Baba will die and leave it to And if he's not ready, somebody will take it. If his son doesn't like it, he will sell it. For a price that even him, when he hears in the grave, if he can hear, he will say, my son, why? Friends, are you ready? There's a call to repentance. Because death is around us. Every one of us sitting here, you are carrying it on your head. It will drop one day. It will drop one day. Whether you are saying you declare that you live to 60, no problem. Live to 80, it will drop one day. No problem. Stay to 100. The other day they were praying for Momnegedu. They say 80, 90. But it's not even my mama said, it's okay. I don't even want to reach there. Some of you want to reach and see whether Nigeria will end or Nigeria will not. No problem. Stay with Nigeria. One thing I'm sure is one day it will knock your door. You don't need to be you don't, you don't need to want it. <laughs> you are going to have it. Are you ready? Let's bow our heads. That's the question. Are you ready? Have you repented of your sin? Are you living a life that honors God? If you're not repented of your sin, just get up where you are and come. Let's pray together. If you are not ready, you know you are not ready. Don't, 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 don't play games. Just get up. If you are outside, we'll wait for you. Just get up and come. Let's pray together. Because your analysis of the last tragedy does not change the fact that you are going to experience death. Are you ready? It's not to look around, it's to ask yourself, are you ready? Have you had a salvation experience? Except you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Then you accept him. Then what Hebrew says will happen, will happen. What Hebrew says will happen. What Hebrew says when he comes back, he's coming to take those who are waiting for him. Are you ready? You are here, you are listening to me, you are in the overflow. Just get, come. Let's pray together and say, Lord, I want to be ready. Because you see, you don't know the time. The Bible says that it has been determined by God. Hebrews says it's appointed unto man once to die. The how we will die, we don't know. The when we will die, we don't know. But the appointment, we know. So are you ready? You don't know the when, you don't know the how. Are you ready? If you are not ready, just come. Let's pray together and say, Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready so that whenever it happens, wherever I am, I'll be sure that it will be a joyful ending. I'll be sure. We sang, pass me not, O gentle Savior. And that's our prayer. Child of God, how is your Christian life? That's the next parable Jesus gives. We'll talk about that. But we can ask you now. How's your life? Are you ready? We sing the song fading away like the stars of the morning. You are fading. Ask God to help you. What's holding you back? Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. That we don't take this that we have heard this morning lightly. Help us. Help us, our God and our Father, to be ready. That every day, when we hear about the disasters that happen, it will turn our hearts to ask the question of our preparedness to meet Jesus Christ. 
Now, eternal Father, according to the promise of your word, that your word will never return to you void until it accomplishes what you sent it out for. On that authority that you've said about your word, I believe that you will do great things with your word. That you will convict and transform. That your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Okay, we well, welcome those who are worshiping with us for the first time. So if I call you, the ushers will direct you where to go. If you're in this room, they'll direct you. If you're in the overflow, they will also direct you. So just watch out for the ushers. They will have their badges on so you know them. Friday, Omeri G. I hope this is correct. Omeri G. Friday. Is that correct? Omeri G. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Friday. Haggai Phoebe Form. Haggai Phoebe Form. Thank you very much for coming. Your friend invited you. Jonathan Audu. Jonathan Audu. All right. Thank you, Jonathan, for coming. We're grateful that you came. Blessing Mark. Blessing Mark. Blessing Mark. Thank you for coming. Your friend invited you. Grace Daniel. Join us also on Tuesdays, and you will have a wonderful time. Thank you again for joining us, and God bless you.